Joining me now from Beijing is Professor Zhang Li, Chair of the Architecture Department at Tsinghua University. From Boston, Zhua Jinhua. He is an Assistant Professor of Urban Planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Also joining us from St. Louis is Wendell Cox. He is Principal of Demographia, an international public policy firm. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Zhang Li, let me start with you. When we look at this plan uh, to integrate these three areas, is this simply an expansion of Beijing or is it something else? How should we look at this? Well, I think we should look at it as something else. It's not to mark a city plan, the continuing sprawl of the already too big Beijing. It should be a rethinking of the urbanizing over the last 20 years in China. And it should be an opportunity to redistribute wealth, information and opportunity to create multiple centers instead of mono-centered city, mono-centered urbanization. Jinghua, uh, this is a plan that's been in the making since 2004. What are the reasons behind President Xi Jinping's initiative in building a mega city region? What will it, will it achieve for the people who live there? There's a couple of things. I mean, it's a good strategy, but in fact, it's already late. Uh, there are several historical occasions that we that it could have happened early that will make Jinjing region actually much better. Now I think we, we recognize the urgency. The first one is you can think of this as a, a sheer necessity. I mean, Beijing is grown to the limit that it cannot sustain itself without uh, collaborating with other regions. The other thing is uh, for, for when a city really grow, many things actually improves both many economic indicators are actually improved by 15% per capita. That's what we call the urban agglomeration. But at the same time, many bad things also happen, also grow when city grows. For example, the congestion, the crime, etc. So now that's the challenge. How do you absorb the advantage of urban agglomeration without uh, or, or constrain those urban potential urban problems? And then strategies try to uh, uh, target that and enable the whole region to grow collectively and make it really a power center there. So Jinghua, you mentioned some of the problems and some of the challenges that uh, the region faces. Uh, will this plan overcome those problems, things like environmental pollution, water shortage, uh, overcrowding? Uh, and what we heard is that there's, there's uneven development right now. Will this overcome all that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, one thing I just to say that uh, having a bigger decision unit, which the three together, itself is not a, it doesn't solve the problem. It just offers a potential opportunity to collectively resolve the problem. That still requires a lot of effort, particularly the institutional collaboration, which has not been the best example in China. Compared to, say, Yangtze River Delta, even Pearl River Delta, the different cities, they already organically grow with each other and help collaborate, even sometimes compete with each other. But for Hebei, for a long time, is kind of isolated from Beijing. Beijing's resources, the power, the talent, it's not really, has not been benefiting Hebei a lot. But so far now, I think with the plan, hopefully that will change. Wendell, this project is known as Jing Jinji. Uh, what sets it apart uh, as an urbanization project from what we've seen perhaps in the United States or in Europe? Well, uh, it, it's, it's really much different. And I think, uh, and, and I think we're all um, impressed with the progress China has made over the last 20 or 30 years. And um, I realize it would have been better to have had better plans 10 years ago. But the fact is, the progress has, that has been made has been absolutely impressive. Um, it is different because the challenges of urbanization are so different. Uh, Beijing has too many people in too small a space, yet close by you have Tianjin, Tangshan, etc., uh, Baodeng, uh, places where there's really plenty of room uh, to grow. Uh, with something like 250 million people expected to move to the urban areas in the next 20 or 30 years, um, and the liberalization of the hukou system, um, th this, this kind of thing is absolutely necessary. And so I think um, you, you really don't have any good comparative uh, examples in Europe or the United States because quite frankly neither uh, part of the world has ever faced the urbanization challenge or the uh, uh, massive reduction of poverty uh, virtually overnight um, that has occurred in China. Zhang Li, when we look at Beijing and Tianjin, uh, they are under the direct control of the central government, so 
they effectively have uh, the same administrative rank as provinces. So what are the advantages of integrating them and how do they actually complement each other? Well, I, I don't think this um, governmental hierarchical um, thing still matters a lot in terms of economy and in terms of cultural development. Actually, I believe this um, geographic, shall we say, connection between these two major cities are creating a new possibility for long-term sustainability because um, actually moving resource and more evenly distributed resource more, shall we say, appropriately arranged and plans for these resources will help both cities in many, many ways. Jinghua, when we look at the practical implementation of a plan like this, will it require the movement of people, the movement of large numbers of people, and really what will motivate them to move? Uh, I think here there, there are two parts. One is to the, the transportation infrastructure for the whole region to really be thought of as a one economic entity, you need the people and talent and resource to be moved freely across the boundary. Here, I think China making a great achievement in building high-speed rail, highways, different sort of uh, transportation infrastructure to bind it together. For high-speed rail, I think most uh, people were aware of China's achievement in the network length, the speed, but one thing I really want to drive attention is the frequency. At the major corridors, the frequency could be five minutes headway. If you look at American, that's, that's a subway frequency. So with that uh, uh, high level infrastructure, there's a potential for people to move around. But of course, beyond the geography and the transportation, there's other institutional constraints. Like Mr. Koss just mentioned, the hookah system. For example, if I'm a Hebei people, I couldn't send my kids in Beijing if I choose to work there. That's a problem. I'm not going to move. So with all this... Uh, 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 intent of integrate, we really have to make sure that people in the whole region can enjoy similar, uh, it is close to similar level of urban welfare so that they can choose their jobs and works based on market need rather than their who code which where they bind them to be. Wendell, if we take a, a region like Herbei, how, how will it benefit from this plan? Well, I, I think greatly. I mean, you, again, I was in Tangshan last year, uh, a place that recovered incredibly from the earthquake. There is plenty of land to build on over there. There's a marvelous new port that's underutilized at the moment. Um, I think there are great possibilities for Hebei. The, you think about the possibility of moving institutions, as has been, been discussed, uh, like hospitals and health facilities and universities, uh, out to Baodang. Uh, that makes all the sense of the world. And also there's Tianjin. I mean, uh, uh, Professor just uh, described the incredible headways on the high-speed rail line from Beijing South Station to Tianjin. Over 200 trains a day are operating at this point. And we have now the new, yet to be opened, uh, Binhai New Area Station. And with all of the uh, construction and development that's gone on down there, there are just incredible opportunities for decentralization of central government functions, um, and, uh, which is, is real important. And then the great uh, thing that can be ac accomplished with respect to places like Tangshan and Tianjin is the encouragement of the export industries and manufacturing uh, to move there. So. Um, Beijing is still going to be big. We want to, apparently, the, the goal is to limit the population to 23 million. It's almost there now. It's going to be tough to manage it. But Beijing is going to continue to grow, and it will grow by growing in these cities to the periphery. Zhang Li, what are the major obstacles you see in implementing a plan like this? Well, the major obstacle is, is the, shall we say, the human obstinacy in believing in the old centers. Um, there is a nostalgic affection towards which has already been established as the centre of the place. And Beijing is currently the centre. Herbei attention is not. By moving, by more evenly distributing resources around Herbei and Tianjin and trying to create new attractions, new centres of attractions, we believe we do have still um, some time to face to actually move mm -hmm. people around rather than um, going back to Beijing. I, I totally agree with uh, Professor Zhang on this because there, there's a strong sense of centrality in Chinese mentality. This is really historically rooted. The sense of centrality operates at multiple levels, at an individual house, at a neighborhood, a city, a region. Because of this sense of centrality, 
there's an over concentration of resources at any industry, any aspect of society. So now I think the Jinjin is to, to some degree decentralized some of Beijing's resources so that it benefited the surrounding uh, peripheral areas.